with me to Hebrews chapter uh, 2, and we'll uh, look at some more of the uh, end of this chapter. <clears throat> and uh, our title, if we had one today, would be family. Family. And our goal today, and, and we do have different goals as we different objectives as we preach the Word of God, but I, I think our goal today would be that you have more or a better appreciation of Christ and who He is uh, in your life and what He's uh, done for you. Several things I want us to introduce us with as we are looking at this text is we have uh, already covered chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, and now uh, we are we are working on finishing this chapter, and, and, and I say this, there's a lot of topics in the rest of this chapter, uh, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts, theological concepts. We're not, our goal is not to exhaust every one of those concepts as we see them in chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, but to highlight some things, because uh, the, the author of our text is really introducing these concepts to us. He's going to to uh, exhaust them for us further as we move into the text, like the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. He's going to mention that for the first time in chapter 2, but then he's going to really go in and develop that thought as we work into it. So we're just going to highlight some things. So don't think we've left anything behind. We're going to, we're going to be able to get all to it uh, as we work through this, this book. But in chapter 1 and chapter 2, you know, you appreciate chapter 2 and you've really seen what's happened in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, uh, our author really is focusing on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is deity, that He's the creator of the universe. He sustains all of the universe. Uh, he's the redeemer. Uh, he's the inheritor of all things. He is sovereign. He's preeminent. And He is over all things, including the angels. Remember us pointing all of that out and that he, he created all the angels and he is over all of them. So it's, we're going to see in chapter 2, it's not that the author is just pointing this out, particularly over that sect of the creation, the angels, because they delivered the law from God uh, to Moses uh, through the angels. Uh, but we're going to see that uh, Christ not only created them as over them, uh, but, but there's another purpose that he's going to speak to us about. Uh, in regard to that. So, but Jesus is the Son of God. He's Lord and He's God. Uh, thy throne, O God. Remember that in chapter 1, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of the angels fall down, prostrate. they worship Him. He is God. But then in chapter 2, He's going to speak about Jesus being below. In chapter 1, He's above. In chapter 2, he's below. In fact, he's going to be below the very angels he created, as we'll see that in this text. And in chapter 2, he's not denoting him as the Son of God, but the Son of Man, pointing out what? His humanity. Chapter 1 is all about his deity. Chapter 2 is all about his humanity. And as he begins chapter 2, we saw that he gave an exposition all through chapter 1 in the first four verses of chapter 2 as an exhortation. Now he says, now that you have understood more about the Lord and what he said and everything that has said, been said about the Lord in the Old Testament up until this point, this is what you should do. This is how you should respond. This is how you should act. This is how you should give earnest heed so that you won't drift away. Why? Because the judgment seat of Christ is coming for the Christian. Not the great white throne judgment, which is for unbelievers in the second, correct, second resurrection, but the judgment seat of Christ where we, we will be judged for our conduct, our works as a Christian, our faith. And we looked at that the last two weeks. And then we moved on and we saw how Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of Psalm 8. And the Lord spoke through the psalmist. He spoke through David and spoke about man being uh, lower than the angels. Um, and he was meant to have dominion. He was meant to have a, be a king. He was meant to be a conqueror. But something happened 
to derail that plan and that purpose in his life. And as we know, it's the fall, and sin came into the human race. And so that dominion was lost. That purpose that God had for man was lost. And so the Old Testament, all leading up to the Messiah, is about God restoring this purpose and this plan back to man, and not only giving us what we lost in the garden, but giving us something much, much greater. So this introduction leads us into uh, the latter part of verse 8 and then into 9 and following. And in so doing, now the author is going to get into the, to the cross. <clears throat> I just uh, got through reviewing and uh, rereading a book called The Mystery of the Cross. McGarth or McGrath, I can't remember how to pronounce his last name. <clears throat> and it was a um, book we had to read in Systematic Theology in seminary. He did a great job on the cross. And one of the things he speaks about in there is he speaks about the fact that the cross is central and crucial to Christianity. Without the cross, you don't have Christianity. You just have a social club. Now, that may be old hat to you, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of folks in the world that don't appreciate that fact. Problems develop uh, for folks as they interpret the cross because of the enigma of the cross. And let me explain what the author is saying here. History helps us to appreciate where we are today and what you have and what I have. In the 17th and the 18th century, there is a um, a period of time that is called the Enlightenment period. Have you ever heard of that period? And you think, well, this is where everybody got enlightened. Well, it, it, it sounds like that's true, but that's not the case. In the Enlightenment period, there is a group of um, theologians, particularly in one particular country, uh, Germany. And um, in this, uh, these, with these group of theologians, they started looking at the Bible in a different way. Tradition, tra traditionally, through the last 16, 1700 years leading up into this time, uh, the theologians and the scholars, those who studied the Bible, understood the cross in the way that you understand it, in the way that I understand it, based on Scripture, based on the eyewitness testimony. Uh, of the gospel writers best based on the testimony of our author in the book of Hebrews. And, and this tradition about Christ on the cross, as we understand it through his atonement, through, through him atoning for sins, was carried all the way. But then there's a group of folks who had a new way to interpret the Bible. And what they said was that you have to, you have to cancel out this tradition. It will uh, taint your view of Scripture. You need to have, a, you need to be a person who's standing outside the bubble in order to have the proper interpretation of Scripture, in order to be objective. In fact, I mean, you couldn't even be a Christian, really, because you had prejudice, because you were influenced and tainted by the tradition that had, you had grown up with and had existed for the last 17, 1800 years. And so you had to stand outside the bubble, and in so doing, you needed to do so and interpret Scripture through level, through logic and reason. And so they looked at the cross, for example. And when they looked at the cross, they saw the enigma of the cross, the conflict of the cross. The parallel lines of the cross. For example, God is just, and so he commits just judgment. But the Bible also says God is merciful. What does someone with mercy do? Someone with mercy gives someone who deserves judgment, someone does not give someone who deserves judgment, judgment. Someone who receives mercy does not get what they deserve, but that is not justice. Justice says you give everyone their just desserts, if I can use that word. And so, on a logical, 
on a reasonable level, these are two parallel lines that never do cross. But in God's word, they do. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And so what did they do to the cross? Since they only operated outside the bubble on this reasonable level, they said, you can't have God dying on a cross because God can't die. That, there, those are two parallel lines. They're not reasonable. They're not logical. It can't happen. And so when we have the cross and the enlightenment period where they started teaching was, it wasn't Christ as you know Christ that was dying on the cross, the God-man. It was just a follower of God. It was a prophet and he was a good man. And what he did on the cross was he just gave us a good example of how we ought to live. But there's nothing about atonement there. There's nothing about redemption there. There's nothing about forgiveness there. And this, this spurred, this it's what we call liberal theology. And this is where its roots were and its seeds, it, they went all over the place. And in fact, they, they, they finally, they, 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 they didn't finally, but they got into our universities, Yale and Harvard, all the Ivy School leagues, man, they used to be, they used to preach the gospel, not anymore. You won't find any vestige of it there. And then churches began to take up on this, on this theology, and what you would find, like in San Antonio, you don't have to go very far, it's the Unity Church. This is exactly what they teach about the cross. I mean, you people out there, you think everybody believes what we believe about the cross. You're wrong. You're confused. There are a lot of people who have no clue about what the cross really means. And you ought to really appreciate that you do, that you got the truth. And that the, preach, the truth of God is preached to you through the Word of God, not through some liberal theologian. Listen, those two parallel lines do cross. Because the Bible tells us at the cross, the justice of God was met in full. Because God vented all of His wrath out on Christ, which is propitiation. That's one side of atonement. The other side is expi expi expiation, which is God canceled out all your sins. So he canceled out all your sins because he, he poured all the wrath out on Christ, and Christ turned that wrath away from you. He paid your debt in full, and therefore God could give you mercy. He could dole out mercy to you instead of judgment. So, so we see the enigma of cross, suffering, and pain, and death bring what? Life. And it's central to Christianity. Now, as central as the cross is, what is even more central is the incarnation. <clears throat> it just, just won't write for me sometimes. I don't want that. Man, I don't want that at all. Huh? There we go. Okay. The incarnation. You've got to have the incarnation on the cross, or you have no Christianity. Now, let me just read some of the text to you and introduce some of this, this thought, because we're not going to, we're not going to exhaust it as I shared with you, but it's going to help us as we go into the Lord's Supper. Remember our title is the word what? Family, okay? Hold on to that thought. Um, the latter part of verse 8, for in him, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That's a, that's a quotation from Psalm 8. In other words, man was, was under the angels. He was made a little old, under the angels. And, and God made him for dominion, but we don't see that dominion yet. That's what he's saying there. We don't see it yet. Oh, we, 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 it's coming, okay? It's coming because of Christ, though. He says, but now we do not see all things put under him. There, that dominion is not here yet, but we see Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeshua is the Old Testament translation for the name Jehovah saves. We see him, though. We don't see the dominion that God had purposed for man, but we do see Yeshua, who was made 
a little lower. That word made there is a perfect participle. That's important. A little lower. This is brevity in time. So, in the first chapter, he's above the angels. In the second chapter, he's, be he's below the angels, even though he created the angels. Why? Because he was made a little lower, brevity of time, but only for a short time, not forever. Only for a short time. He was made a little lower than the angels. Angels don't die. Angels don't suffer. Angels don't get tired. Angels are powerful. But he was made a little lower than them for a brief time. And he was made, the perfect participle means that this new nature that he's going to be made into, that he's going to add to himself, add to his deity, is going to be permanent. Even in his glorified state, that's what this perfect participle says in this verb describing this new event that's occurring in the second person of the Trinity. Now, as we move on, speaking about the incarnation, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that's where he is now, he's crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. <clears throat> When we speak about the incarnation, it, 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 it's, it's, it's hard to get, wrap yourself around it, <clears throat> but we're going to try. Now, here's what happened. The second person of the Trinity always existed. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. They always existed and they always will exist. They've always exhibited and, ex and possessed life, eternal life. But a point in history, a point in time occurred in which the second person of the Trinity left heaven and joined through the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary with her egg. At that point in time, the second person of the Trinity, who is God, deity, who is the creator and the sustainer of all the universe, added humanity to himself. Now, why did he do that? Yeshua on the cross, here's that thing about the cross again, the incarnation of the cross, Yeshua on the cross could do for you and for me as Yeshua, as the God-man, what God could not do for you. Did you catch that? You see, because God can't die. You see, because the price had to be paid. You owe a debt to God. Every single person in here in this room owes a debt to God that you cannot pay. And the penalty for that is death. Uh, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 4, the soul that sins shall die. That's just the way it is. And so the only way for you and for me to be forgiven and to have redemption and, and know God and be in his family is for someone to die in our place. But God can't die. So what's the solution? Well, there isn't a human being that can do it because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So before the foundation of the world, God the Father had planned, had purposed that the second person of the Trinity would come down to the earth and add humanity, humanity to himself so that on the cross there was going to be a man who was going to die, Jesus Christ who is not only God, but is also man. Not only the Son of God, but the Son of Man. And in his humanity, he was able to die on the cross and pay your debt in full to God the Father so that the justice of God was met and God could then dole out mercy to you. So, so what the Lord had to do, he had to do this, he had, in the later part of the text in chapter 2, he had to be made a man. He had to be made like us. 
And listen, not so that he could, he could do a better job in the old race with Adam. Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is not called the second Adam. A lot of people, you see a lot of theologians even saying that. A lot of, it's nowhere in Scripture. It's utterly false. Jesus is not the second Adam. He's not saying, oh, we're just going to do a better job with what happened to Adam. No. He says, we're going to start over. He's not the second Adam. He's the second what? He's the second man. He's the last Adam. He said, that's that. We're not doing that anymore. We're starting over. We're going to get a new race. And he was the first one in that race. He's the first of many fruits to come, the Bible tells us. But he had to become a man like us. Now, now, hold on to that as we close. For it was fitting for him, that's God the Father, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain archaegos, the captain of their salvation, perfect through surfing. That word is uh, one who is a leader, who's a pioneer, one who, uh, the captain, one who blazes the trail in order to open up the way for the rest of the folks behind him. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He blazed the trail. He opened the way up for you and I so that we could have access. The writer of Hebrews is going to talk a lot about that in Hebrews chapter 10 with the Father. And and we don't have time to to work through all of this. I I want to get down. We'll work on this a little bit later. But I want to get down to verse 14. In so much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. Talking about you and me. Partaken is the word koinia. It's a word that we just, it, we're naturally, it's something that happened. This is not unique to anybody. We're all human beings. We all partake of flesh and blood. Koinia, that's the word. We have common fellowship with each other because we're all human beings, okay? It's all common to us. But he himself likewise shared in the same. Ah, there we go. That's the incarnation. But that word is meteko. Meteko. That's a different word than koinia. That means that he added something to himself that he didn't have before. And that's what Jesus did in the incarnation. He added to himself humanity. He did not have that in eternity past. But he did in the incarnation in Mary's womb. Because he had to become one of us. He had to be made like us in order to die for us. That through through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's another day. Verse 16, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That that word, uh, that phrase there, give aid, is to take hold of. It's to take somebody by by the arm, to take somebody by the hand and take them along and help them. And that's the word that is used in Jeremiah chapter 31 and 32 as the prophet Jeremiah looks back in the Exodus and he sees God taking Israel by the hand and pulling them out of slavery, pulling them out of Egypt. And he's leading the way and he's taking them by the hand. That's what Jesus does for us and what he's done for us. And then look at verse 17, and, and the seed of Abraham is, is for everyone who by faith believes in Jesus Christ. It's not just Jewish folks who are Christians, but Gentiles. It's everybody. Verse 13, 17, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and high priest. And then look back, <clears throat> one last thing, look back here where it says in verse 12, we're going to close with this. I will declare your name to my, this is Psalm 22, to my brethren. Now here's something you you might not have understood prior to today. Prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus never, ever called his disciples brothers. He called them disciples, he called them followers, and later as he got towards the resurrection he called them friends. He never called them brothers. 
It wasn't until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the first person that Jesus was going to see was who? It was Mary. You remember what he told him, told her? Go get, go fetch my brothers. Go get my brothers. That's what he said. Now, I'm telling you, it doesn't get much better than that. Because by becoming a man, he didn't make us his brothers. But by becoming a man and dying on the cross and being buried and raising again on that third day, he made us brothers because he brought us into a new family. He adopted us into his family. And he has the same the same existence today that he had on the earth in his glorified state, and that he is, he is the God-man. And because he is the God-man, he is still our brother, which means we all have the same father, which means God must really love you and me. In fact, he said he wasn't ashamed to call us his brethren. I don't know about you, but in my life, there have been times when I've been ashamed of Jesus. The only person I should have been ashamed of is Mike Clements. I'm so happy that the Lord became a man, died on a cross for me, and made me his brother. He shared in humanity in order to make us brethren. Now that's a new thought as you observe the Lord's Supper in Jesus laying down his life, his body, and his blood, his humanity. Let's pray. I know, Father, we, we covered a lot in a very short period of time, and, and I don't want us to get lost in all the details. I want us to really come to know you and appreciate you in a better way. One of the things that I learned this week is, you know, we, we see vestiges uh, of God in different things. The creation. Mozart, the arts, and they're all aesthetic. We like to look at the wonderful, beautiful colors and things in the world and come to know the Lord in a little bit better. And certainly, there are traces of the Lord in all those things. But listen now, you will never, ever get to know the Lord better than at the cross where he died. Through the pain, through the suffering, through the agony, and through God, the Son who knew no sin, becoming your sin for your sakes. It is the summit of knowing the love of God. And today in the Lord's Supper, we certainly want to think about that. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.